Hi and welcome to the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast for athletes, coaches and professionals who want to achieve their goals faster. I'm David Charlton and I'll be sharing proven methods from leading athletes, coaches and experts that will help you get the most from your talent. Today's show is sponsored by Functional Intelligent Training, who are a sports injury clinic located in Gosforth, near Newcastle upon Tyne, and specialise in athlete development, nurturing future champions, strength and conditioning support, and excellent rehabilitation services. Today we're going to be looking at the topic of emotional control, an important element of mental toughness, and something that a lot of golfers and athletes have challenges with. If you Google emotional control quotes, you'll find things like from Tiger Woods. I think the guys who are really controlling their emotions are going to win. Then you've got Anika Sorenstam. I don't worry about what other people are doing. And I don't think about things I can't control. That's the important element there. I don't think about things I can't control. Lastly, the key to golf is playing one shot at a time. And the key to life is living in the moment. Yet in golf and all sports... People can find that a struggle from getting too far ahead of themselves, getting excited about winning, lifting up the trophy or winning the race, or dwelling on mistakes, getting stuck in the past. And this guest is well qualified in this area, having worked with some of the best golfers in the world, some major champions. That's right, today's guest is world-renowned performance coach and author Carl Morris. Hi Carl, it's good to see you again today. It's been a while after doing the Mind Factor course and seeing you at different seminars. Good to see you again. Good to have the chance to chat again. Definitely without doubt. I'm sure the listeners will pick up plenty of gems from, <laughs> from your advice. Well, hopefully there's one somewhere in there. Let's <laughs> <We'll> see <laughs> what we can do. I'd, I'd like to think so. So today we're, we're going to look at emotional control, which is a huge element of mental toughness and a bit of a challenge that some golfers face from time to time. So starting with that, what do you see are typical challenges golfers do have? If we look at professional golfers to, to start with yeah. on the golf course. I think it's, I mean, first of all, I, mean, I think it's an area that's so overlooked that, that there's such a, p- a potential opportunity for, I would say, virtually everybody from, you know, early, early starting in the game to, as you say, right up to playing on PGA Tour or, or European Tour. Um, you know, and a model I've sort of shared with a lot of people over the years is that every every shot has three parts to it. There's there's what you what you think or what you process before the shot. There's the execution of the shot, and then there's your reaction to whatever the golf ball does. And as I said, virtually nobody looks at the third part. You know, when, whenever we watch golf on TV and somebody hits a bad shot, it's the swing that always gets the blame. You know, we'll see Tiger Woods at a or whoever. Tiger Woods hits the ball off to the right, and an expert comes on the on the on the uh, you know the telecast, and somebody says, "Well, what did Tiger do on that one?" And, and they'll they'll put the swing up there, and they say, well, "He dropped it on the inside, or he, or he you know he, he he flipped it, he got trapped, or whatever the buzzword is." You know, and, and I think that's a too simplistic view of it because you know he he didn't seem to be getting trapped on the inside for the previous fourteen holes. Why why has he suddenly got trapped on the inside on the on the fifteenth tee? But perhaps if we rewound a little bit and saw the fact that, you know, maybe Tiger three-putted the previous green and he was furious about it. You know, he three-putted from eight feet on the previous green. He walked to the next tee, maybe didn't go through his normal communication with his caddy. Then, you know, it opens up a different debate that that, that the shot that you actually see that goes offline, can it be traced back to the reaction to a previous shot or a previous putt? And I think that's where... You know, most of us playing golf could could dramatically improve if we if we looked at. It's not so much. I, I've often said it's not so much the bad shot that's the problem at golf. It's the reaction to the bad shot that's the that's the real issue. You know, yet ironically, you know, starting from your next game of golf, you you could you could endeavour to be better at that. And you know, I, I don't see too many downsides to to improving the way that you you react to to, to what the golf ball does. You know. If, if getting angry and calling yourself names was a formula for better golf, there'd be more scratch players out there. <laughs> no doubt about it. And yeah, you, you often find as well that people do make a mistake like that. Their instant reaction is to start thinking about the technical aspects and changing things up. Do you, do you find that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Because that again, that's what I think we're conditioned to do, aren't we? We've been so conditioned on TV and analysis that bad shot equals swing change equals the swing is at fault for that particular shot. No, it may well be. You know, if you've, well, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not so naive as to say we don't need to work on our swings. Of course, if you've got tendencies in your golf swing that are, you know, if you pass eight to the right or eight to the left and you've got a club face that's flapping around all over the place, well, you know, you know, you need to do some work on that. But just to isolate always that a bad shot is a result of, of, of a swing that's changing, I think misses a big, big part of the, of the puzzle. And, but I think probably more importantly, when you're in the middle of the round, middle of a game of golf, with the best of intention, it's tough to change your golf swing. But what you, what you can, I think, in a round of golf get better at is changing your attitude, changing your reaction. So to, to me, what this is about is, is, is about everybody listening to this. If you, think of, if, if, if you think of your golf game as it is now, ask yourself the question, are you getting the best out of what you've got? If you didn't improve your golf swing at all, are you getting the best out of it? And if the answer is yes, well, you know, just work on your golf swing. But if the answer is, yeah, I, I, I should be scoring much better than this. I, I do see good capability on the range. Well, then perhaps it's time to maybe look at what you do before the shot, what you do after the shot, how you react to things and your, your general attitude. So I think what it does is just, Instead of Pia Nielsen came out with a great one on the podcast that I did, she said, you know, she feels sorry for the golf swing because it always gets the blame. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That gets criticised yeah. an awful lot. There's not many. Yeah, there's not many people actually look at how nice the swing is and the nice smooth rhythm to it or anything like that, is there? But it's a, it's it's almost the easy it's the easy victim, isn't it? It's the easy scapegoat, really, because you can see it. You know, you can see the club face. You can see. Um, the angle of attack you can you can see your low well you can't see your low point but you can analyze all those things where you know your emotional reactions and the 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 the, the effect of a cortisol spike in your system isn't quite so easy man you, there, there's more technology with that now with things like whoop but you know i think up to up to very recently it's very difficult to sort of gauge emotional reactions so we, we, we tend to just point at the obvious thing to look at which is which is the golf swing but as I said you know put anybody listening please I'm not saying for one minute don't work on your swing I'm not saying the swing isn't important I'm not saying mechanics aren't a part of it they are definitely but it's that it's that quest of getting the best out of what you currently have when you play you know the the, the art of playing golf as opposed to the science of the golf swing and you mentioned that uh... A little bit about the the aftermath of the shot, which which most people, a lot of people, don't look at whatsoever. How do you go about training that? Yeah, I mean it's 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 very individual, David. I mean I'm I'm a a big fan of um, a really radical idea, to be honest. The idea that as coaches we should perhaps watch people play golf. You know, <laughs> I mean it, it, this 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 crazy notion that we should we should actually see people in the in the environment that we play the game in. Because you know, I've, I've long since said this that we're perhaps the only game in sport, as far as I'm aware of, that most coaches who coach the game don't actually see their students play. They, they see a they see a snapshot of them as a golfer. They see the golf swing on the range, but you know, get somebody out on a golf course and you know see how they react to a three putt, see how they react when there's out of bounds on the right hand side and water left and things like that. One of the things that I found really useful. As a, as a sort of thing that some everybody listening could start to work on straight away is play, play a round of golf. And, and this, this, this sounds a paradox, really. Don't try and change anything, but just play a round of golf and merely observe your reactions. Just go out there and, and kind of imagine that you've got a camera following you around and the camera's actually just going to watch the way you, you, you react to all the shots. And that camera is taking some footage that's going to be displayed to people other than yourself. And, uh, you know, without getting too, too deep into the, the woods on this, you know, the, the idea that when you observe something, the, the, very, the very act of observing it potentially creates the mechanics for change. So um, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting one to do because years ago what I used to do is – is, is go out on the golf course and I'd film people playing 
playing golf and I'd film the reactions and then I'd show them on a screen afterwards. This is this, you know, this is what you were behaving like on the golf course. And they'd look at it and stroke the chin and say, Oh yeah. I'm not normally like that, you know, because it's 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 kind of like the, the 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 reactions that we have on the course become so embedded and so natural and normal that they become habitual patterns so that we don't even know that we're doing it. You know, and, and, and if you said to me, Well, why do why do angry people get angry? My response would be that they get angry because they get angry. They get good at getting angry. They, 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 they are triggered to respond to in a certain way to what a golf ball does. And you just get very good at the anger response. But the, the, that, that first port of call, and as I say, it sounds a, it sounds a bit of a, of a paradox or a strange one, but just, just promise yourself that you're going to go out and you're going to note for 18 holes your your reactions how do you react to the chaos that the game throws at you know i i'll even have players play play 18 holes and say well what what as a, as a follow-on from this what you could do is play 18 holes and if you feel like you've reacted to the shots on that hole in a beneficial way give yourself a tick and if you on the other hand if you feel like you've reacted like a child to to what's happened out there in a way that's caused a spiral you've got to put a cross on the scorecard so you basically got a chance for 18 ticks only interrupted by crosses now the good thing about that is that you engage people competitive competitive side then and they don't want to see a card littered with crosses because you know basically you've then proven to yourself excuse the language you know you behave like a dick for 18 holes because you, you, your reactions have been so so poor so there's kind of lots of subtle ways I've found over the last few years of, you know, this, this idea of emotional control and, and we can get, you can get very deep into the sort of science of it all and it all gets very complicated. Or you could use some simple ideas that are very practical in nature that A, are interesting to explore and then, you know, go out and play around the golf. And if you can get 18 ticks on your scorecard where you've reacted pretty well to anything that's come along, well, if you come off that round of golf, the very least that you know is that you've given yourself the best chance. You know, you've done the best you can that day. You've not, you've not let poor reactions cause you to drop more and more shots. Because even at, the, even at high handicap level, that's generally the case. You know, we'll, we'll play a hole badly and then we'll play another one badly and another one badly. And, you know, pe people are not generally off 18 handicap because they go and make 18, 18 bogeys. They're generally off 18 handicap because they have a lot of pars, maybe some birdies, but they'll throw eights and nines in there, which again, that's got some relevance to the swing. But a lot of it can be because you reacted badly to what happened on the previous hole. Yeah, I love that notion that when you're talking about observing and then the mental scorecard as well, and the yeah, the ticks and the and the crosses, because ultimately it's just helping people take a step back, isn't it, and recognise that maybe oh, right on the eighth hole I did yeah. this. Naturally, this back nine, I'm not going to do that, and they can then adjust and make relevant changes going forward. What is a simple thing, David? The ticks and the crosses. You know, as I say, a it's fun to do it. It's, it's educational for yourself, but also it's a great mental tool because. You know, without even telling yourself, you're not going to want to see six crosses on the trot. You're not going to want to see six holes where you've reacted awful to whatever's happened. You know, it, it's. I think that's the problem in many ways with the with the mental game and coaching the mental game. Unless you put some ways of kind of observing it, or you put some ways of of some kind of statistics on it, it's very difficult to measure. But you know, my experience is when people when people do this you know, they, they, they can see there's, a, there's often a correlation between, you know, poor reactions and poor scores. And then on the upside that they start to see, you know, if, if everybody listening played 10 rounds and played this game, do some analysis afterwards. Is there a correlation between your reactions and the scores that you do on a given day? And if you can get close to 18 ticks and your score hasn't improved, well, okay, we've eliminated a variable. We know it's not that. It might well be swing. But, but just for a period of time, you know, do something a little bit different. Look for the culprit in some different areas other than just whether you've, you know, you've come across it a little bit from the top of the backswing. I think the fact that you, you're sitting there for a period of time, a lot, a lot of people can get caught up in, well, I'll try that for one round. I, yeah, I don't like doing that and they'll ditch it. But if you do it over, whether it's four, five, six, ten rounds, then you start building up those better habits, don't you? Yeah, and, and in effect, what you're doing is you're creating change without trying to change. You're just making a game of it, you know, and, and 
we, we're human beings, we love games. That's why, you know, I know we're not going to perhaps talk about practice today, but I, I think for for most players, if there's an element of games in practice that give you statistics of where you, your game, where you, 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 the quality of your golf is, is, is a great thing to do. So, but yeah, to, to, to get more objective about it and actually have something tangible, then it's not quite so sort of airy fairy and, and, and left field. It has a, it, you know, there's a real practical element to it that, as I say, I've had players that just start to get to a point where there's just immense pride that you've played a round of golf and that you know you've given yourself the best chance that day. You might not have had a great overall score, but you've given yourself the best chance. Now, the interesting thing, I mean, I've seen it at the highest level, you get, you get players who get better at this and they might play a few tournaments where, you know, they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of making cuts and doing okay, but nothing, you know, they're not, they're not ripping any trees up. But then all of a sudden, they, they actually as a result of reacting better to, to shots, they provide a platform to release the more of their A or B game. And all of a sudden, you know, if you're swinging it half decent and then you're reacting pretty well, well, then it gets interesting. You know, then you get a lot closer to your true capability then. Again, getting back to the whole thing about reactions, do you find with like some of the top players that you've worked with, they can get caught up with the whole thing about like you know thinking about the trophy, um, you know, getting ahead of themselves? Is that common? But it's not. It's not common. It, it, it's 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 everybody. <laughs> it's, you know, you, you know the 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 idea that, that good players just stay in this you know zen like state and never think about winning is is nonsense. I mean, they might say that on the some of the podcast, not the podcast, some of the interviews after that, but, you know, good, good players get ahead of themselves just like, just like we do, you know, top players do it. But what they do have the capability of is, is I think they get better at noticing that the mind's jumping into the future or, you know, going back to the past and, and, and they have the ability to, I call it reset. You know, I think reset's a good concept that you reset back to, you know, it is the, the old cliche, but it, you reset back to this task. What is this task? You know, the task here is, right, par four, you know, wins off the left. There's a bunker on the right-hand side. I'm just going to just, you know, let it drift from left side of the fairway into the middle of the fairway. So I, I think the idea that good players don't, don't have negative thoughts, don't get in their own way, don't think ahead, I think that's, that's nonsense. They, they do because that's what the mind does. The human mind is has a mind of its own. I think the idea that we can control the mind is, is ridiculous. You know, um, I often tell the story of Graham McDowell, who worked for a long, long time. He, he, he told me the story when he was about to win the Scottish Open in 2008. Um, he was playing great. He was leading the tournament. I think he was about four or five in the lead with four holes to play. And he, got up, he walked up onto the 15th tee and he said as he was walking up onto the 15th tee, a thought just popped into his head that he was going to top it off the end of the tee. And you think, Jesus, this is a great player playing the best golf of his life. And he just gets a thought, pops in his head, he's going to top it off the end of the tee. And he said, when he got the thought, he started shaking. But then he said, he said he recognised it for what it was, that just a thought that had popped into his head, collected himself. And, you know, just got on with the task and, and, and he did smash it down the middle. So, you know, again, I think that's a, a, an important message for everybody that, you know, for me, the big route forward is not so much to think that you've, you've got to be in a perfectly calm state with a still mind, because that, that just doesn't happen very often. Even in the presence of discomfort and even in the presence of feeling a bit shaky, you can still get the job done. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the key message for me is, is that, Rather than, rather than looking to, to be in a perfect mental state, just understand some key elements. And, and yes, out of nowhere pops the thought, I'm going to top it or shank it. But you don't have to buy into that thought. You don't have to, you know, a great phrase I had, a, a, you know, a mindfulness coach said to me, you know, he said, you don't always have to believe what you think. And that's <laughs> a great line. I think that's a great line. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, I think thinking about that, I, I was just writing a blog a little bit earlier it was around the Jack Nicholas saying of where he said he'd never missed a short put in his life. Story, I think the Rotella story goes along the lines of that that, that Nicholas, Nicholas said in a seminar that he'd never missed a putt from inside three feet on the back nine of a major tournament. And apparently there was, a, there was apparently there was a guy in the audience who put his hand up and said, "But Miss Nicholas, I saw you recently in the I think it was the U.S. Seniors opening. You definitely missed one from inside three feet." And Nicholas looked at him again and said, "I've never missed from inside three feet on the back nine of a major." Tried to carry on. 
little guy stands up apparently and says, but Mr. Nicholas, I've got it on film. I can send it to you if you like. Nicholas wasn't having any any of it. And apparently this guy, um, I think I'm right with the story, it went up to Bob Rotella, who was in the audience, and he said afterwards, he said, he said, what's wrong with Jack Nicholas? He said, um, he said, why won't he admit to missing that short putt? And apparently Bob said to me, he said, well, what do you play off? He said, um, 18 handicap. He said, oh, I said, that's, uh, that's interesting. He said, if you missed a short putt, would you remember it? He said, yeah, of course I'd remember it. So he said, let me get this right. He said, Jack Nicholas, the greatest golfer that's ever lived, and you off 18 handicap, and you want Jack to think like you. <laughs> it's just, uh, it, was a, it was a lovely story. Whether it's true or not, it's irrelevant to me. It's just a nice story. <laughs> exactly, yeah, which we all need good stories. Yeah. Yeah, thinking about the, the theme about staying present in the moment, an important question there that you brought up was a player should ask themselves, you know, what is the task? What's mm-hmm. the task in hand? I, I like to say, or what, what's my job? Yeah. What other things can players do to help ground themselves in the, in the moment? Well, again, it was reinforced to me on the, the, you know, the mindfulness courses that we did on um, the Mind Factor over, over lockdown and uh, Bin Harris, the, who's, who's been coaching mindfulness meditation for, um, he's been involved in it over 40 years now. And he, and he talks about support, about how we, ne- we need a support to bring us back, to, to come back to the present. Because as we've already said, David, you know, our mind is geared to go forward, to plan ahead and to conceptualize and to imagine. It's also, it's also geared to ruminate about the past and review and all that kind of stuff. So in terms of a support, you know, what Vin really reinforced for me is that, that our minds will constantly do that. But one great support is the body. You know, the very fact that when you bring your attention to your physical body, you can't move the body into the future. You can't put your body into the past. You know, it is, it is here and now. So it is a potential great support. You know, and, and I found golf's a good good opportunity to practice mindfulness when you when you're playing you know that again it might sound a little bit bit left field but for anybody who gets who struggles with this potentially you could pick something body wise to focus on after the ball has gone so even something as simple as becoming very aware of the feeling of your feet on the floor well all of a sudden if you're tuning your attention to the feeling of your feet on the floor by definition your feet are here and now you're experiencing that in the moment. And just that simple thing, actually, a lot of players have been really helped by that, but it's just a safe place to go to. It's a safe haven when all the chaos is raining around you. And you you know, you know, can't tell yourself, don't think about the trophy, don't think about winning, don't think about getting your handicap down because you'll just think about it even more. But what you can do is notice that kind of thinking and think, okay, right, what's my support here? Right, I'm just, I'm just going gonna, gonna to see how, many, see how many paces I can walk focusing on the feeling of my feet on the ground or it could be it could be the breath i heard a great one about paul ratcliffe um you know the, the great marathon runner and you know i think there's a parallel with golf with with running a marathon that you know she said that the worst thing a, a marathon runner can do is two-thirds through the race is be aware of the finish line and, and how far you've got to go you know and, and, and you hit the you hit the famous wall and apparently one of the one of the mental tools that she used to use was that she would just ask herself, could she count 100 breaths? Now, you think, okay, might count 100 breaths. Sounds a bit monotonous, but she would do it. And one, two, three, her mind would wander. She'd come back to it. But then if you think about it, 100 breaths later, you're an awful lot nearer the finishing line than you were 100 breaths previously. Mm-hmm. And then she'd perhaps reset and do it again. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, anecdotal things like that, you see that these great athletes have found ways of being present. Um, you know, by using a support like the breath or the, or the feet or, or, or whatever it may be. So, you know, a lot of this isn't new. None of it's new. It's been around for millennia, you know, all, all the sort of Eastern traditions, the, the sort of martial arts at the heart, they bring the, the attention to the body. They bring your attention to your breath. So, you know, I, I, just, I just think golf can be a lovely laboratory, I can't even say it, a lovely laboratory to actually practice some of these things that can be beneficial in other areas. And also in golf, we're really fortunate, aren't we? There's beautiful scenery around there, fantastic surroundings, trees, flowers, lakes, all this sort of stuff. We're not in the middle of a housing estate. So players can focus their attention and really look to pick out and notice 
things on the golf course. And again, that can be really helpful to ground them. There's the sad thing is, David, and I would certainly count myself guilty of this when I played a lot, is it, you know, trying to play as a, as a younger player. I, I, I could walk 18 holes and just look at my feet for 18 holes, waiting for a golf ball hmm. to do what I wanted it to do to make me feel good. And you, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I can think of a couple of players, European tour players, where uh, we've worked on that very thing. And, you know, sometimes you kind of latch onto the opportunity in the right place. And I think I can think of one one player in particular that we worked on what he was going to do in between shots. And um, he'd, he'd been one of those by his own admission, he would have been a bit, bit of a grumpy golfer, a bit angry about what went on. And we sort of just made a pack for two weeks, see what happens for two weeks, where as you're walking along in between shots, your eyes stay above the flag and you notice your surroundings. And... The, uh, I'm going back a few years now, but as I, as I recall, the two surroundings for those two weeks were one, one week was Glen Eagles and then the other week was, was Cran Sursier, which are two of the most spectacular um, areas of natural beauty that you'll, you'll ever play in. And I'm not saying it was just down to this, but, you know, he finished, I think, he, well, he finished third, I think third at Glen Eagles and then second the week after it, at, uh, he, he, I think he lost in a playoff at Cran. Um, as I said, it's not just down to that. There was a whole bunch of other things came 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 right as well. But you know, the, the report back was that just by doing that simple thing of keeping your eyes above the flag and just noticing your surrounding, yeah, you know, it certainly didn't it certainly didn't cost him any shots. That's for sure. Yeah, well, yeah, like you say, it just grounds you in the moment. You don't mm. get stuck thinking about the the past shots, the bad mistakes, or the or, or the future. So yeah, it can only be a helpful tool. You know, how many how many weeks did we all spend in lockdown thinking, oh, I'd just love to play golf again? And, you know, I had, I had to laugh. I had a caddy report back to me that one of the players that um, he'd been in lockdown and was dying to play again, and he'd got out to practice. And the very first time that they'd gone out to practice, he, 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 he'd thinned this wedge off a, off a bare lie. And the next minute, he's, he's, he's burying the club in the floor and saying he didn't want to play anymore. <laughs> and I think, you know, the, the gratitude didn't last very long. <laughs> the bit you mentioned about the again getting back to mindfulness and putting your thoughts into your, your body it, it can be so subtle as well when you do that type of technique on it where a uh, technique i use quite a lot with players that i work with you know when you're putting and perhaps you've got to wait for two three four minutes for playing partners and you're standing over a short three foot put four foot put you're a little bit anxious you're a bit tentative I get players to focus their mind on their feet. I'll get them to raise their toes off the ground about a centimetre and then just drill their attention into the, the feeling they've got in their foot, in their leg. I might even get them to raise their heel again for a centimetre. Again, drilling that attention into their foot, into the leg. All they're doing is noticing what they're feeling. And then before they know it, it's their turn to put. And they've calmed down, they're more grounded, and away they go and, and play the put. The great thing about that exercise is that it's so subtle Nobody has a clue that you're doing it. It's not like you're stretching out doing a lunge or something like that. All you're doing is raising your toe or your heel. And it's so effective, yet so simple. You know, I, I have a kind of simple formula with it, with, with attention, because I think attention is the key word in the mental game, is what you're paying attention to. And my sort of simple philosophy is when you play golf, you've either got your attention on something useful to you or, or useless. Now, if you're on if you're on the green and you've got as you say you've got three to five minutes to wait and you know putting your attention on others and getting anxious and you know or getting uptight because they're taking too long you know if that's useful to you well carry on doing it but on the other hand for most people it isn't it just works them up it just gets them in a in a poor state they perhaps don't pay attention to their own put but yeah as you're standing there why not why not just focus your attention on the rise and fall of your breath at the very, very least, you'll feel calm. You'll feel, you know, it's a pleasant thing to do. Um, and, and I'll say that this whole area of mindfulness, you know, the more you look at it, the more people in, successful in business employ some of these ideas, you know, going, going back to basketball in the, in the sort of 80s and 90s. I know Phil Jackson, um, famous basketball coach with the, the Lakers and Chicago Bulls, you know, he, he, he brought a guy, there's George Mumford, I think the guy's name was, and, and, and taught the players mindfulness, you know, and, and that was radical in those days. But Michael Jordan embraced it. And when Jordan embraced it, wow, all of a sudden the, the rest of the team, you know, looked at it. And 
again, as Vin, as Vin Harris says to me, you know, I can't think of many things that you're going to do worse by being present. <laughs> yep, you're not going to dwell on those mistakes. Yeah, no, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, painting, painting your garage or getting your tea ready or being in the gym or holding a putt to win your club championship. Well, the more, the more present you can be. And, and I think the, the idea that you can suddenly switch it on on the golf course without any kind of practice is, is again, erroneous. You know, I think the more you can embrace, and it doesn't mean to say you have to sit on a cushion every morning for an hour with your legs crossed. You know, you can, you can embrace these, these things in, in traffic, you know, you can do it. And, you know, another good coach that I know talks about, you know, just checking in with the breath. Once a day, twice a day, ten times a day, just check in with it. Even if it's just for a minute, it just you just get better at, at guiding your attention into more useful places. Yeah, it's, well, it's pretty much like developing a skill in your golf, isn't it? Be yeah. putting or your chipping. The more the more you do it on a short, regular basis, then yeah, the, the better you get at it. No doubt about it. If you never practice your chipping, good good luck trying to play, you know, an array of shots on the on the courts. But if you can develop some understanding of how the bounce works on your club and you can get some consistency with with your trajectory but that only comes through developing the skills as you as you said David so again this is a very rounded approach isn't it we're not just saying oh just you know sit under a tree and think positive that would be nonsensical we're talking about developing some 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 rounded skills to get better as a player and yeah and as a person in, in your life as well in that respect yeah so thinking about the like what we've talked about in the last half an hour there, what would your three takeaways be to motivate a golfers who might struggle to control their emotions on the golf course? Uh, I think, I think the, num- the number one thing would be uh, to, to, to see, it as a, see it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity for an area that you can work on that is, is potentially only going to be beneficial to your, to your game and probably, probably your life in, in, in general. I think uh, the, the other one would be, as we've talked about, is rather than forcing yourself to, you know, rather than telling yourself, right, I'm going to go out there and, and you know, be, be swan-like and just never react to anything today, that, that's not going to happen. But just play that game, play the observation game, make a game of it. Give yourself a cross, give yourself a tick, depending on how you've reacted to the shots and observe, see what, see what happens as a, as a result of that. Um, and then I think the other one we've, you know, we've covered this this idea of of body being a potential support to be a bit more present to what's going on here and now this you know all encompassing cliche of playing one shot at a time is is a tremendous skill to, to to gain and and as i say not 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 just in golf but but life in general the more that you can catch yourself ruminating about the past or jumping off into the future and just bring yourself back to the task here whether it's getting this document done or you know finishing a report or sewing a piece of wood no matter what the hell it is the more you can just bring yourself back to you know i think i think people who are effective in life in general just are pretty good at finishing stuff off you know they'll get a thing done you know we talked about before we came on onto this about writing a book you know and everybody says that they've got a book in them well you know if you, if you have, well, get on with it. But the thing you've got to do is if you're going to write a book, you, you need to start with the first sentence. I mean, in fact, you need to start with a title and then start with the first sentence. But it's surprising. You know, what, you know writing a book's a good example. If you, set this, if you set yourself the task of 500 words a day, it's next to nothing. I'll tell you what, if you write 500 words a day, you'll be surprised how, many, how, how, how quickly something starts to come together. You know, a couple of months' time, you've got a few thousand words. Thanks for the tip there on the, the book writing. <laughs> yeah, that for free. <laughs> so we've got three things there. So see it as an opportunity to I suppose, be the best version of you as a golfer in your life. Look to observe yourself in order to observe your behaviours on the, on the golf course, be that after shots with your reactions or, or between holes. Mm-hmm. And then the third one is try to ground yourself with your bodily experiences. Yeah being mindful if you like yeah. uh, in order to, to reset and be a bit more focus your attention in the right places yeah i think great all, all, all of those are definitely not going to make you worse but they could it could be a big breakthrough yeah it could be one shot two shots three shots if it's, what, if it's one shot it's a start isn't it mm, certainly is that's right so whereabouts can people find you call yeah if um if they want to look at the uh the two, the two books that are out there that have been having some good reviews on amazon uh, that uh, Gary Nichol and myself wrote that there's the lost art of putting 
and there's also the other one, the newer one, which is the lost art of playing golf, which covers um, some of the things that we've talked about, but quite a, quite a bit of other things as well. We're getting some nice, uh, nice, nice, nice reviews on that and some nice comments on it. But the, my, my website, you know, if anybody's uh, interested in uh, anything with the Mind Factor in terms of uh, Mind Factor certification, which obviously you did, um, that, that the website is themindfactor.com. Brilliant. I'm sure people will get uh, lots from your website and the different resources that you share. I know certainly I've been enjoying your, your podcast over the last year or so. It's been you know, some great reminders on there for myself. Yeah. Thank I'm, you. I'm myself. <laughs> when I say, <laughs> yeah, when I, when I, say it, I think I need to remind myself of this stuff. Yeah, yeah it's easy to forget, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate your time today, Carl. My pleasure. Thanks very much. I'd like to give a big thanks to today's sponsors. Functional Intelligent Training, who are a sports injury clinic located in Gosford, near Newcastle upon Tyne, and specialise in athlete development, nurturing future champions, strength and conditioning support, and excellent rehabilitation services. Thank you for listening to Demystifying Mental Toughness today. To sign up for tips and advice to help you be the best that you can be, go to wwwsport excellence.co.uk and sign up to the Mental Edge newsletter.